You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. Just the other day, I saw a breathtakingly beautiful proposal. It was for a housing development in Toronto, near the waterfront. It is being pitched as the replacement to the Sidewalk Labs initiative that had ultimately been turned down. I have to tell you, it looked gorgeous. Green space everywhere, an urban forest in the center of it, organized around community gathering places, with affordable housing units in buildings that looked unique and futuristic. It was a neighborhood that would make a real architecture and design statement for this city. Naturally, my reaction was, wow, that's amazing. It'll never, ever get built. If you want to know why our guest today was moved to explore the reasons that architecture in this country is so bland and mediocre, my reaction to this proposal sums that up. The process for making anything unique and beautiful and expensive in buildings today in Canada is so impossible that by now, people like me no longer expect anything but the cheapest, most functional option. And that's what we get. And so after a while, that's all we have. But does it really have to be this way? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Tracy Lindemann is a freelance writer and author who wrote about Canadian architecture, the good, and more often, the bad, for the walrus. Hey, Tracy. Hi. Why don't you start and maybe to lay the groundwork here, what are we talking about when we say Canadian architecture? That's exactly the question that I ask in the walrus article. What do we consider architecture? Are we talking about, um, you know, Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City? Like, we mm-hmm. would probably agree that that's architecture and that maybe the Calgary and Halifax libraries are also architecture. Um, but is a Home Depot architecture? Like, is an Iroquois longhouse architecture? What about the glass condo towers all over downtown Toronto? Right. Uh, and and I think that, you know, as the general public, maybe we can't really agree on what we would consider architecture. Uh, but as as we know, you know, all uh, instances of the built form are are considered to be architecture. And, you know, before I became a journalist, I actually studied uh, creative arts and art history. Uh, and through that, I really did come to understand architecture as an intentional act of art. So trying to make something beautiful on top of also being functional. So in my mind, that's what uh, I define as architecture. Well, one of the reasons that I'm so happy to talk to you about this and maybe get to the bottom of what's behind the current uh, lack of inspiring architecture maybe in Canada today is, is that every time a government or a municipality or even a business or a hockey team or whatever unveils a new building, there almost always seems to be this collective shrug of disappointment from people who care about this stuff in Canada. That that sounds about right. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm trying to figure out, I mean, you're also trying to figure out why this is, but maybe start us with an example because you start your piece uh, with a discussion of the Ottawa Library, which again, big library, our nation's capital. This is a chance to pull off uh, something incredible, right? Yeah. Well, and even in the city's uh, press releases, uh, when it, it, you know, announced the, that it had awarded the contract, um, you know, they, they said that they wanted an iconic building, you know, to really be like a showpiece for the city of Ottawa. And I don't think that's really what was accomplished here. So right now, if you look at where the library is supposed to be, it's nothing. It's just an empty field in the middle of nowhere in downtown Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Um, But if we look at the mock-ups, it looks pretty conventional as far as Ottawa aesthetic goes, like lots of melamine, cement, floating floors, like that, you know, that cheap stuff that you click into place. Mm. And like when I first saw it, I thought like, eh, it's okay. It was nothing special. It wasn't like the worst building I've ever seen, but it wasn't special. And it wasn't the iconic, you know, quote unquote, iconic building that Ottawa said it wanted. So ultimately, I came away with the feeling that, you know, it was kind of quintessentially Ottawa in spirit, you know, functional, boring and cheap, (laughs) except that it wasn't really cheap because that price, when they initially awarded the contract at $192 million, 
as we've seen uh, in re- more recent news reports, the cost has now ballooned over th- uh, 300 million. Um, and uh, I spoke with uh, Catherine McKinney, a city councillor who's now running for mayor. And they told me that, you know, at the time when they were evaluating their bids, uh, they really wondered how it could be possible to build that building for 192 million. And, and then they said, now we know they couldn't, right? Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like for that money, they could have awarded the contract to one of the European firms or one of the British Columbia firms that bid, which all have better track records for making more architecturally stunning buildings than the firm that ultimately won. I was going to ask this question a little bit later, but maybe I'll ask it now since you've alluded to it a couple of times already. Can you explain um, the process for bidding to build one of these buildings and and how it usually works in Canada? Yeah, so requests for proposals uh, are called RFPs, um, and it's basically a multi-step, very long, drawn-out process where... Um, you know, you kind of put out a paper saying, like, we're looking for a building that, you know, accomplishes this, that, and the other thing. Like, for example, it needs to be LEED certified or, you know, it needs to represent some kind of symbolic something or other. Mm. And then, um, you know, architecture firms are invited to bid uh, on the uh, project by, you know, outlining what their vision is and then by saying how much they're going to charge for it. Um, And then that kind of goes through this approval process that typically tends to favor the lowest bid. When you favor the lowest bid, like a situation like what happened with the Ottawa Library may happen where, you know, what you end up paying is not really the lowest amount you could have paid. Right. Um, And uh, by consequence, you kind of get something that is a compromise between, you know, aesthetics and function. Um, And so that's the situation that a lot of of these uh, publicly or partially publicly funded projects find themselves in. Right. There's this pressure to respect the public purse by kind of just going with the cheapest thing available, gets the job done, and then you don't get all those people saying, my tax dollars paid for this. (laughs) They're going to say that anyway. Exactly. (laughs) Is that different? Is that a process that's different um, in other countries? Like, are there other ways to do this aside from RFPs? Yeah, I mean, like the uh, Calgary Library didn't do an RFP. They did more of a design competition. So their process, they invited, um, you know, firms to to bid and then they kind of made a short list and then they paid uh, for development process where, you know, they really prioritized the aesthetics of the library. It, was, it wasn't just coming down to cost is basically how they uh, approached their tendering process. And when you look at the building that they ended up getting, you see what your money can get. Um, And even if uh, the firm that won, Snaheta, was not the cheapest, uh, in the end, their library was something like $250 million. um, And it's beautiful. Meanwhile, Ottawa's is almost $350 million and arguably not that beautiful. You talk to a lot of architecture experts and and architects themselves for this piece. What did they have to say about, you know, generalizing Canada's approach to architecture? What kind of buildings do we typically build? Well, I mean, you don't have to look very far to see uh, what kind of buildings currently we're looking at building. You know, just in downtown Toronto, it's a lot of glass towers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can see, you know, the cranes putting them together and that kind of stuff. It's kind of like a perpetual piece of the Toronto skyline at this point. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of those buildings are private, right? They're run, they're put together by private developers. Um, There's not really like a public consultation process built into it in the way that public buildings are built. But, um, you know, they kind of opt for these glass towers because they are reasonably inexpensive and quick to put up, and they don't really take that much effort to design. And they're going to sell those condos and office spaces regardless. So for private construction, cities will be like, yeah, but, you know, like, they're the ones paying for it. Like, we'll just let them do whatever they want. When it comes to public design, 
you know, there's a little bit more of a different process because then, you know, some level of government, whether it's municipal or provincial or sometimes even federal, there's some level of government involved in that process. But the people making those decisions aren't always and often aren't architects or people with even a design background. Right. They're, they're procurement specialists. Yeah, exactly. Like they may have a checklist that, like I said earlier, you know, there might be like, uh, okay, lead certification, uh, no more than 12 floors. Like, you know, there might have like, they've checked off all the boxes, but. But there's no box for inspiring. Yeah, exactly. One of the reasons I was fascinated by this story is because our approach to it seems so typically Canadian in that nobody wants to go out on a limb anywhere and potentially face blowback and potentially make something good. Where does the lack of risk come from and and what do architects have to say about that? Like there is there is risk involved in in trying to make an inspiring building, right? Because I mean my thought immediately goes to uh, the crystal at the Royal Ontario Museum here in Toronto, which I think is really interesting and cool. And lots of people hated it as soon as it was made. <laughs> yeah. Like, I have to admit that I don't hate the ROM. You know, like, I read a piece in uh, Azure magazine um, about it, and someone from uh, the Toronto Architecture from Partisan said, Beauty emerges when design misbehaves, and that's misbehavior. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, I think it's interesting. And I, sure, it doesn't fit with the buildings around it, but I think that was kind of the point that they were getting at. The buildings around it are the typical Toronto buildings we've been talking about. Yeah, exactly. And it, that's not to say they're not beautiful, too, in their own way. It's just that this obviously stands out, but like that was the intent of the project. In a situation like that, you know, a lot of designers and a lot of, you know, municipal government people and, you know, a lot of all the various stakeholders may look at something like that and be like, oh, my God, people hate it. I hate it. Like, look at it. It looks so weird compared to the rest of what's around. Overall, like, Canadians are risk averse. Mm -hmm. Canada is always trying to play it safe. And I think that when it comes to aesthetics and design, you know, we would rather play it safe by getting something functional and inexpensive than ex- than potentially expensive and ugly. But, you know, the, all this kind of reminds me of, like, you remember the Chateau Laurier debacle also in Ottawa from a few years ago where yes. um, the Chateau Laurier, which is a hotel in downtown Ottawa right next to Parliament, um, they wanted to add an, uh, an addition, like a wing onto the hotel to expand you know, the number of rooms that they had. And so the design that they came out with looked, according to a lot of people in Ottawa, it was like the worst thing ever. It looked like a radiator. It looked like a jail. It looked like the gate that, uh, you know, you build to keep bears out of the dumpster. Like I saw so many different comparisons. But the thing with doing that, number one, Chateau Laurier is only 100 years old. Like it was built to look old, but it's not really that old. Hmm. But regardless, it's still a heritage building. Um, And like one of the key parts of adding on to heritage buildings is that you're not supposed to replicate heritage design. You're supposed to add to it in a modern way. Uh, But in Ottawa, people were like, it should look exactly like that old design. And ultimately, like the project fell apart. And I just find that all very, very typical of Canadians in general, maybe not Quebecers. I do think Quebec has a bit of a different culture around design uh, and different standards, Uh, but definitely it feels like the rest of Canada. How much of that? I'm glad you mentioned Quebec and and, uh, the Chateau Laurier, because my next question was about just, you know, when we're a young country, as you mentioned in the piece, like 100 years old is actually fairly old for a Canadian building. And yet compared to some of the buildings built in that style, it's incredibly young. And and how much of it is just, we weren't building things back when there were amazing things to be built and building stuff these days is, is much harder. And, you know, there are more costs to take into consideration. Um, I don't know about that. I think like buildings weren't cheap back then either. You know, Quebec City and Montreal are are some of the oldest places in Canada that were settled. Right. Yeah. And, you know, for example, Ch- Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City or Windsor Station in Montreal. 
um, you know, some buildings like the St. Joseph's Oratory, uh, then the Church Reins du Monde uh, downtown. Like, these are all examples of more like a European style of architecture. And, you know, we're maybe not building buildings like that anymore uh, in Montreal and the rest of Quebec. But I think that in Quebec, there's still a push to just not accept the lowest bid possible. Hmm. And that really shows in our buildings. And we also let younger firms take on public buildings instead of just designing people's houses, right? You know, a lot of architects in other parts of Canada, they kind of get stuck building people's private homes. And there aren't a lot of rich people in Canada with great taste. Right. So. <laughs> um how much of the function over form, and I might be completely off base about this, but but how much of that is due to, you know, these buildings have to be functional. Um, we have a pretty tough climate at times, and you want to build things that are ready to stand up to whatever the weather throws at them. I mean, if you look at how we currently build with these glass towers, these glass boxes, that's not environmental. That's the, it does the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. It lets in the cold and keeps out the heat. If we zoom out a little bit and look at the, you know, the carbon footprint of construction in general, construction represents 30% of all greenhouse gases. Um, that means the carbon it takes to produce material. Uh, that means the carbon it takes to actually build it. Hmm. Um, and glass and concrete are two of the most carbon-intensive products that we can make. Right. So it already starts at a deficit there. I just don't buy that that we have to like do it for the cold because I went to Norway a few years ago and I um, did a tour of a positive energy building. And uh, later on, I ended up writing an article about it for City Lab, which is now owned by Bloomberg, mm -hmm. where I was talking about how you know, in this climate that's as cold or maybe even colder than Canada, how they were able to accomplish a building that not only has less of a, a carbon footprint than conventional buildings, but it actually produces more energy than it consumes. And that excess energy is was used at the time, I don't know about now, was used at the time to power a uh, hydrogen fueling station for vehicles. So there's no excuse why we can't do that here, right? Yeah. And yet, you know, typically we accept constructions that check off the lead box and nothing more. What could governments do? And how much of this is on governments at, at every level to work together? What could they do to, while respecting tax dollars, um, do a little more, do something inspiring, do something that's more than just functional? I think one of the key things that we all need to think of and remember is that when you build a building, that's not the last time you pay for it. Um, you know, like there are maintenance costs. Uh, and if something is built cheaply, that means maintenance may cost more over time. There's like an amortized environmental impact that you pay for long after the building has been built. Mm -hmm. But typically people tend to fixate on the purchase price um, without really thinking about the long-term cost of this thing that we've built. So that's one aspect of it. And then there's also this idea that, um, you know, we're so committed to bureaucracy and being cheap that, you know, we're not willing to pay for something, even if it's just a little bit more expensive and it could be the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. And so I think what, what our society needs is, one, we need more city architects. Edmonton has one. Uh, I'm not, I haven't heard of another Canadian city with a city architect, but what these people do is that they are hired by the city to advocate for beautiful environmental design um, on the municipal level. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's like a counterpart in the provincial government or something like that. Uh, and the other way to improve how Canada looks in terms of its built form is to hold more design competitions and to stop taking the lowest bid. Like some countries, like uh, I think Austria, they, they have this policy where, you know, they take the second lowest bid. But like there's some pros and cons to that idea in the sense that maybe like, you know, the second and third lowest bidders collude with the lowest bid and like produce something like, you know, corruption <laughs> that, that is like rampant in Quebec. Right. So like maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, but I just think that 
prioritizing something that has a really sound environmental design that may cost a bit more, but in the long run costs a lot less is, is one way of doing it. We don't have to accept the cheapest thing just because we're cheap, you know, think Mm -hmm. of, think of the bigger picture. My last question is the headline of your piece is why is Canadian architecture so bad? I know you don't write the headlines, but you also put that question to architects. When you were finished reporting this, did you come away with confirmation that our architecture is bad or a different perspective? Um, it's not to say that every single building in Canada that exists is hideous. Uh, there are some examples of great architecture. But the overwhelming feeling that I came away with is that we just don't want to pay for something beautiful if we can just have something functional. Um, and maybe that comes from a little bit of a distrust of government. Like maybe we don't trust the government to spend our money wisely. Maybe there's a grain of truth in that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they haven't always made the best investment decisions with our money, but you know, this is kind of the compromise that governments have arrived at is that, okay, well, like you don't trust us and we don't want to like abuse the public purse. And so we'll just like meet somewhere in the middle. And like, that's the, that's the, we'll just choose the most basic thing. Um, Some of the people I spoke with also didn't want to just write off Canadian architecture totally because actual architects, like the people who design stuff, There's a lot of really amazing talent in Canada. It's just that they don't get the opportunities to do these big impact buildings. Maybe they don't have the capital up front to kind of like secure uh, materials or that kind of thing. Like, you know, whatever. But, Mm -hmm. But it just feels as though a lot of those smaller, really interesting firms don't get the opportunity to do cool projects until they've like built their case. Um, and maybe we should you know, give give a chance to those firms. Like, you know, we're obviously not doing like the best with what we have now. So why don't we let them show us what they've got? We don't have a lot to lose. Thanks so much for this, Tracy. It's fascinating. Great. Thank you so much. Tracy Lindemann writing for The Walrus. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can find us on Twitter at thebigstoryfpn. And you can talk to us anytime via email, the big story podcast, all one word at rci.rogers.com. You can find this podcast in your favorite podcast player or in your least favorite podcast player if you're so inclined. Please do rate and review. And as always, tell your friends. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. <laughs>